All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the International Association of Woodcarvers. Today is November the 7th at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, we thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to take a brief minute to uh, thank a couple of guys that are behind the scenes because I haven't done that recently. Uh, big thank you to Tom Bate, who is our behind the scenes guy. He does all the computer work and muting, and unmuting, letting everybody in. So uh, thank you, Tom, for all of your work. And uh, Larry Green, thank you for joining us today. And uh, thank you for all your assistance as far as getting all this set up. Uh, we appreciate your help as well. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, today we have on uh, Jared Wood that's coming to us from Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, Jared's gonna be doing a demonstration for us today. And uh, Jared's been carving since, he's not, since he was nine years old on and off through the years. Uh, and he's gonna be doing a demonstration uh, before we get started, I just want to uh, remind people about a few classes that are going on. Uh, Dave Stetson still has his Mel Bus class that he'll be doing in December. Uh, if you're interested in participating in Dave's class, reach out to him on Facebook. Uh, he'll be happy to take your money and sign you up for the class. Uh, Kevin Apple Applegate has a couple of classes that are coming up. Uh, I think a couple of Santa classes. So if you want to contact Kevin, I think he's on today. Uh, you can also see his information out on secondalarmwoodcarving.com. Uh, so check out Kevin's classes. Uh, Chris Hammock, who we had on last week, is uh, doing ongoing classes on design and uh, creating caricatures. Um, if you want to contact Chris and sign up for one of his classes, he's available. And Alec Lacoste is still doing cottonwood bark classes. So if you're interested in his classes, reach out to him. I uh, also wanted to tell you about an opportunity from somebody who uh, has presented for us in the past. I don't know if you all remember Danny Bolts. Um, she came on and talked about spoon carving and about creative living way back, probably week five or six. I'm not sure how, how long ago it was. Uh, she's doing a creative living workshop for anybody who might be interested. Uh, you can look up Danny Bolts on uh, Instagram if you're interested in participating uh, in her class. Uh, it's November the 11th or the 13th. And uh, she'll be happy to have you. So again, her name's Danny Bolts and uh, you can reach out to her on Instagram or contact us and we can give you the information. Uh, again, today we have uh, Mr. Jared Wood on. He's gonna be talking a little bit about his carving journey and uh, doing the demonstration for us. So uh, Jared, we'll go ahead and turn it over to you. And you'll have to unmute, Jared. There we go. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we got you. Okay, all right. So uh, let's see, I started carving when I was about nine and I got really interested in carving um, because I saw, uh, you know, all these Boy Scouts whittling all these cool things with their fancy Boy Scout knife and you know, the uh, ball in the cage and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I thought that was really interesting. And then I, I mean, we didn't have cable television growing up, so we watched PBS. And there was a guy, Rick Boots, on there that um, did carvings. And uh, I thought that was really awesome. And I really wanted to try that. So you know, I had a pocket knife and, uh, you know, I, I got a stick and was trying my best to to put something into it. But um, um, before that, when I was really young, um, maybe five, six, I got really interested in drawing and painting and things like that. And I still paint and draw. Um, and so I wanted to try wood carving and see if I could put some of the things that I was drawing and painting um, into wood. Well, I sucked at it. <laughs> and uh, ended up cutting myself really bad. Um, and uh, I hit uh, an artery in my hand and uh, it caused a lot, of, uh, a lot of problems. So I put carving down for quite a while because I was afraid I'd cut myself again. And um, so fast forward, you know, I, I continued painting and drawing and when I became an, you know, an adult, I thought I'd try it again. And I didn't start in caricature carving, I actually started in spoon carving. So I carved spoons for quite a while. I still carve spoons and, and different keen items. And I really enjoy that. And 
So during my spoon carving uh, journey, I learned the different types of cuts that spoon carvers typically use and the different tools and sharpening techniques and all that. And what I found out from all that is there's some really good ways of using tools and knives and whatnot safely without cutting yourself. And that's kind of what appealed to me. And so then I decided, you know what, I, I'm, I'm getting a lot better at carving and, and using tools and uh, maybe I can try caricature carving. So I, I actually started doing flat plane animals and whittling flat plane animals with pocket knives. And, you know, I, I, uh, I changed my pocket knives, you know, if you talk to any whittler, you'll know that they, uh, they do quite a bit of work on their knives um, to, to make them carving ready. Uh, first thing I do is take off the secondary bevel and, and change that into a, a single uh, flat grind primary bevel, kind of like a zero grind knife. And, um, you know, then of course they've got to be super polished. So, um, so the facets are nice and shiny and clean. So I started doing that with pocket knives. I started doing flat plane um, animal whittling. And then I kind of morphed into trying more complicated projects. And I guess um, somewhere along the way, I got really interested by people, uh, a lot of whom are on this, this Zoom meeting right now, uh, to really kind of start pushing the envelope of what you could do with the medium of, of wood. And so that kind of um, opened up a lot of doors for taking wood carving and trying to push it more and more and more and get more extreme and, and so on and so forth. And, you know, I, I, I don't claim to be perfect. I just want to be better than I was yesterday. <laughs> um, and so I'm, I'm just constantly learning, you know, and uh, constantly fiddling and trying to push it more and more. And, uh, you know, if I, if I carve something, you know, and I go deep, I ask myself, can I go deeper, you know? And uh, most of the time I just push, push the tool in deeper and see what happens. And, uh, you know, sometimes that means that I ruin things. And sometimes it means that I find out something about myself that maybe I could be a little bit more courageous than I originally thought. And, uh, you know, confidence, I think is a real hard thing as an artist um, because you're constantly asking yourself, I think if you're true to yourself, you're probably asking yourself, how can I improve? Am I, am I where I want to be? Um, I, I didn't do that as well as I could have, whatever that is, you know, um, whether it be carving a, a nose or carving an eye or whatever, or painting or whatever. And so you, you want to be better the next time. And so that's, that's kind of, how I've evolved um, somewhere along the way. Also, right about the time I was really heavy into spoon carving, I started um, getting into chip carving. And that's pretty common from what I understand with a lot of spoon carvers and bowl carvers alike is that they want to decorate their pieces with some really ornate cuts. And so they learned some chip carving movements. So I got, I got really into chip carving for a while and I, I still like chip carving. And so somewhere along the way, I kind of stepped outside of a lot of the traditional ways that I've seen other carvers, um, you know, uh, the process that, that they use. And, and I was like, well, maybe if I start using some of the things that I've learned from spoon cover, or maybe if I use some of the cuts that I learned in chip carving, but apply it to wood carving. And what I found out was from just a lot of doodle sticks and things like that, because if, I mean, if I'm honest, I probably do more doodle sticks than anything. And it's not to really capture uh, the process where you see the progression of step one, step two, step three, 
a lot of times I'll just take and sit on my back porch with a cup of coffee and just work, 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 work on one face or one idea, maybe a set of eyes and see how many different ways I can make a set of eyes. And so what you'll see if you've seen any of my work, I don't have one way of doing any particular thing. It's kind of how it hits me at that time. Um, maybe what I'm inspired by recently. Um, maybe I'm inspired by you know, a particular carver and I just really wanna try um, getting the effect that that particular carver got. And so uh, I really carve on a whim and I paint on a whim too. Uh, sometimes um, when I'm painting, I'll seal it first with say BLO and then I'll do a series of washes and um, you know work through the process that way. But a lot of the times, and I'm gonna I'm gonna scroll over here because I'm having trouble. My my window of seeing what I'm doing is real small and I'm not sure I'm seeing You'll need to unmute that one also, Jerry. He's muted. Yeah, for some reason I was muted there. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay, sorry about that. So, um, I eventually realized as I started working through uh, the process and really evaluating my carvings, I started seeing a lot of similarities between my carvings and chip carving. And you can probably think of a lot of the cuts that we make and a lot of the cuts we make are swooping cut cuts where, um, you know, it's like a, it's like a moon shape. Um, or a banana shape or um, like a, a triangle on either side of the nose, those triangle style cuts. And those are chip carving cuts. And so um, I started looking at the elements of my carvings and I was like, well, you know what? Maybe I just need to just work through the process, do the carvings the way I feel is right. And, you know, if, if it turns out great, great. So, um, that was a hard thing for me to do because I, I've never looked at my work and been happy with it. Um, my, uh, my paintings, my carvings, I never look at them and go, dang, that's good. I like that. <laughs> and, um, cause I'm always looking of ways to improve it. So I'm just never really satisfied with it. So, um, Confidence has is, is really been a difficult thing to, to keep in mind or to focus on because all too often you see other works of art and you're just like, man, there's, there's no way I'll ever get that good. And, you know, that, that brings me to a point that Blake and I were talking about before the meeting started, and that is too often, I think artists, especially new artists, they try to start out and they want to make a masterpiece with the very first thing they do. You know, they want to, they want that first carving to be great. And um, then they're disappointed when it's not. And, you know, really good carvers, uh, like a lot of people on this meeting, um, I'm, I'm sure they can think back to all the times that they've, that they've, uh, you know, hack stuff out like Grog the Caveman and, and it, it was terrible looking, but you know, they, you got to keep going. So I would say to any new carvers in here, um, go easy on yourself and don't expect your, your stuff to be fantastic straight out of the gate. I mean, every, every time I carve something, I look at it and go, man, I wish I would have done that better. So, uh, you know, it's like chasing the Holy Grail. I, I don't think a person really 
really ever gets to that point where they're just like, you know what, this is perfect in every way. And it's an absolute masterpiece. Maybe some people do. I just, I don't think I'll ever get there. But uh, so I, that, that's probably the best piece of advice I've ever given new carver is just chill out and enjoy the process, have fun with it. And, and don't worry too much about making a masterpiece. Just learn from uh, what didn't work and what did work. And uh, so, so sometimes I'll take a, a carving that, um, you know, I, maybe I really like the way the, the nose turned out or the eyes turned out. I'll just take some close up photos of, of that and maybe I'll sit down with a blank and try to work out that same process again and, and then just really make it my own. And that's kind of what I did with uh, some of the eyes and some of my ornaments and my different faces. Um, you know, I, I like to make happy carvings. I don't like making angry or sad carvings or scary carvings because the, one of the reasons why I carve is because it makes me happy and it makes other people happy who get my work and they look at it and they go, you know, I can't just help but grin when I see that smiling face on that, that whatever you gave me. And so I like to make happy carvings. And so, um, you know, this set of eyes here um if you can see that very well he's kind of got a very charming grin on his face and that does something to his eyes and i don't know i just one day it i had an aha moment and you know the eyes uh came out and i was able to figure out how i did it and you know i i do that sometimes so um other times i'll do different um you know, expressions with the eyes. Sometimes I'll even use flat plane eyes because I, I really got into uh, flat plane carving. Um, you know, people like Axel Peterson and Gunnarsson and Trig. I actually have a Trig carving upstairs. And um, Harley Refsel's work, uh, I really like his stuff. And so a lot of those things, uh, you know, really had an impact on the way I do things. So with that, um, I guess I, I kind of evolved into this, my own way of doing things to some extent, but I'm still so heavily influenced by other artists um, and their creativity and their kindness and in, in showing their process to other people. Um, so, you know, I, I, I've taken things that I've seen from from other artists and and tried to use them myself because it's enjoyable and and it helps me through my process so uh does anybody have any questions about any of the junk that i just rambled on about okay hey, Jerry, just a little bit, <laughs> tell us a little bit about the tools you use are you just a knife carver or do you use palm gouges and other things too or Sure. So I use uh, a combination of fixed blade knives, pocket knives, palm gouges. Um, I even use axes. Um, a lot of times when I start out, like, you know, I'll, I'll start out with a blank like this. I buy these big 20 pound boxes of assorted basswood from Rockler and it's, it's okay wood, but it's cheap. And I get a lot of it. And so I'll, I got a lot of this stuff that was, you know, big sheets. I was like, what the heck am I going to do with this? And uh, so I was like, well, this would make good ornament material. Um, so I'll take an ax and I'll split it and I'll get these big chunks and I'll take a handsaw and cut them to length. And then from there, I'll cut them into some, some sort of blank like this. And as if any of you have dabbled with, um, spoon carving you know you can get pretty decent with an axe and so I'll take a carving axe and um, and I'll uh, hack that into a rough shape it saves me a lot of time in the rough out phase and you can even get pretty close to the block out phase with uh, with an axe you know I'll I'll take the uh, the planes off the sides and and you know, bring a ridge up here to at least get pretty close to, uh, uh, 
you know, that 90 degree angle. Cause I do like to carve on the corner. I will carve on a flat, but, um, you know, I, I just find it much quicker and easier carving on a corner. So, um, I use mostly Helvy knives and, um, I have assortment of different styles of knives. I don't have too many. This one is a, a termite. It was one of Dwayne's knives. And then uh, this is a, this is another one of his shapes. This is the baby beaver. I've got two of these. I ordered a second one by accident, but it was a happy accident. Um, this is one of Don Mertz's patterns. This is the Dragon 2. And I like these up sweep knives quite a bit. And I really got into that from spoon carving because I started using knives like Sloyd knives. Um, and I, I really like the versatility of Sloyd knives because they have a flat portion where you can plane flat with. And then they also have a curved portion where you can do scooping type cuts with. And they have very pointy tips so you can get in tight places and make those real tight turns without breaking your tip off. So this is a this is actually a more a 105 that I changed the shape of the handle on, uh, more like a 106. And um, I do have 106 laying around here, which is what people mostly use as a Sloyd knife nowadays. Um, so. With that, um, let's talk about some of the gouges. So this is kind of a, this is a cheap gouge that came in a set that my mom bought me for Christmas or something. She got off Amazon. I don't even know what brand it is, but she got it and, uh, you know, it needed a lot of work. And, um, but I noticed the steel was really good. As I started sharpening it, I noticed that, you know, it was behaving like, you know, a uh, 440C stainless style blade or a alloy blade. And I was like, well, that'll work. So I put some work into it and uh, I've got some really sharp and very reliable and inexpensive gouges, but it didn't come easy. I had to do a lot of work. But I mean, that said, I mean, I get flex cut tools and I'm just really never satisfied with the way they come and maybe y'all probably feel the same way maybe but um you know i spend probably a good hour hour and a half uh on a brand new you know flex cut or a, a ramelson or been a little bit disappointed with some of the ramelsons that i've got um in that uh they come pretty imperfect and uh even has some catastrophic failures in the steel uh where they they broke straight away and they shouldn't have because uh you know, after this amount of time, you know, you, you learn how to not break tools, right? And uh, if they're breaking after that, there's problems. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I've got a, a pretty wide assortment of different tools. Um, to answer the question that probably some of you are wondering, uh, am I primarily a knife carver? No, I'm really not. Um, I do enjoy whittling. Uh, it's, relaxing to me. It's, it's fun to, you know, like this piece I whittled with a pocket knife the other day. I didn't use a single gouge on it and that's fun for me. I enjoy that. So, but, um, it can take a little bit longer. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I, I typically use a mix of palm gouges, knives, and so, so on, but, I, I, I will oftentimes, and most of the time I do start out with, if you've watched any of my videos on uh, Jared Wood Carving uh, on my YouTube channel, I, a lot of times I will either start with this or uh, do an entire carving with this Mora 105. I call it the Widowmaker because uh, it, it'll tend to reach out and, and grab you if you're not careful. So, um, you know, it's, uh, it's definitely taught me some respect over the years. Um, gloves. So I do use gloves um, a lot of times. I don't always use gloves. And I use gloves for a different reason than most people use gloves when they're carving. 
I use gloves because as I'm working, I tend to get a lot of blisters because I'm, I'm just really getting in there and, and going after it. And, um, and also when I'm working really hard with my hands, for some reason, my hands will sweat real bad. And, uh, so I, if I have a slip, it'll be because, uh, my hands are sweating. And so, um, I actually use them just for blister protection, really. Um, but, um, and I, I use two of them instead of just the one. Um, I've tried the tape route that a lot of guys and gals use. It just bugs me too much. I uh, just, you know, having a big old fat thumb right there just, um, bugs me. And when I pair cut, I pair cut differently than a lot of people do. So I was going to talk about some of the cuts that I use and the different ways that I do those cuts as I'm doing the demonstration. And, um, I'll show you a little bit of the way that I've decided that works best for me. And hopefully um, if you try it, and you, you like it, it'll work good for you. If not, um, disregard, <laughs> but um, it's Santa season. And, and uh, you know, I do, I do a lot of ornaments for my family and friends and stuff just as something that I like to, give a lot of gifts this time of year. So I know that that a lot of people are, are used to hearing Santa this, cowboy that, and uh, you know, they're probably tired of, of seeing those types of things, but maybe um, through the process of this, we can discover some stuff together that um, will be of interest. So, um, this would be just a basic blank. And like I said, I, I don't have a, uh, I don't have a bandsaw. And so I don't use any bandsaws. Um, if I have to do anything like bandsawing, I'll uh, maybe use a coping saw if, if I've got to really get in there in some tight corners. But uh, by and large, I'll, I'll hack it out pretty dang close with an ax. Um, I might use a draw knife here and there, um, but I'll use, I'll use the widow maker here and, and get it pretty darn close. And then I'll start putting in my details. So, um, with that, I'm probably ready to get started. I've rambled on long enough and you guys have been pretty patient with me. So let's try to get in here and get to the rat killing. All right. Hopefully the, the light is decent enough that you guys can see, and I'm gonna to try to, bear with me. I'm gonna to try to get in a position where you guys can see. Can you see the blank okay there, Blake? Yeah, you're good. Yeah, that's good. Okay, okay perfect. All right, so let me grab a pencil here. All right, so I'm gonna start by uh, laying in the bottom of the hat line and um, basically where the ball of the hat will go, okay? Now, one of the things that um, I try to keep in mind as I'm planning a design, and I'm gonna preface this with, I don't claim to be the best designer, okay? And I, I definitely don't claim to be the, the most creative person out there, but one of the things that I'm always trying to keep in mind as I'm designing something is, the continuity of the lines. So these, these deep parts here, if they're not flowing into one another very well, then you're gonna have a lot of little gross tear out bits in the corner that can be somewhat annoying to deal with. So when I'm planning those things, I try to keep in, that in mind. Uh, let's see here, I'm gonna draw a center line, but I'm gonna draw it kind of off offline just a little bit okay and uh let's see here i'm gonna draw 
like an eye line right in there, but it's going to be kind of wonky looking. Now, um, one of the things that I've been trying to work on as, as I've been progressing here is getting away from real straight shapes. Uh, I tend to be like by default, a straight shape kind of guy. And that's pretty boring for people. And so, you know, by watching people like, um, you know, Don Mertz and, uh, you know, uh, Dave Stetson, I think he's on here today. Um, I, I've noticed that they, they, they have a lot of flow to their piece, especially Dave. He's got just such great movement in his pieces and, and I'm really inspired by that. And uh, so I try to keep some of the things that he's talked about in mind when I'm planning some of these things, okay? So, um, you know, I'm gonna figure maybe the bottom of the face is somewhere down here and then about halfway up is the bottom of the nose. And then about halfway in between there, of course, is the mouth, roughly. Okay, so I'm going to go in here, grab the Widowmaker, and get to business. So one of the things that I try to keep in mind is that as I'm using a knife is when I'm stop cutting and so forth, I'm... I'm trying to use the knife in like a sawing motion and that helps me cut through the wood fibers more cleanly. And it also polishes the facet as I carve. It's one of the ways that I keep my carvings cleaner than would be if I didn't. Um, I do use a lot of uh, push cuts and when I'm cutting, I don't tend to, I don't make flat cuts. A lot of my cuts have a curve to it. Part of it is due to the shape of the blade and part of it is due to, well, things in the real world aren't really flat, especially people and animals, they're curved. So I'm trying to cut curved as I go. So I'm going in here and at the top of the hat, I'm going in, I'm pushing down and curving out. And that creates that, that curved cut. So I'm gonna go in here and do the same. Just along the hat line, I'm just gonna push all of this back and down. Okay, here's a pear cut. One of the ways I pear cut is I don't come to my thumb, I curve in this shape. So I never really bring the blade to my thumb like people often do. It comes around. And so by using motions like this, I'm able to really control where that stops. I, I told you a little bit earlier that uh, the way I cut myself, when I cut myself right through here, uh, was with a pear cut that slipped off, slipped off the wood. So um, that's the way I pear cut now. All right. So rolling slices, and I've already made the hat brim stick out quite a bit. All right, so I'm gonna go in here on the side of the face and uh, bring that down a little bit. Okay, so you can already start to see that the nose is starting to come out a little bit. Okay, curved cut up here. And then by just simply going down the side of the face and uh, shortening that up a bit. I'm basically going down and cutting down this way because I've relieved the wood that would normally catch the knife up here. So now I've created space for the knife to go and now I can get in here and start doing things on the side of the nose. 
So I'm gonna go on, on underneath the nose a little bit and take out some of that wood and really push that nose out a little bit. All right, so there we are. All right, so let's see what we want to do with this guy. I don't really have a pattern in mind. I'm just, I'm just doing things the way I always do them, I and that's just how I feel at the time. Uh, okay, so I'm going to use a smaller knife here. I've gotten to a point where I feel pretty comfortable with things. Mm, I'll just use this guy right here. I'll use a smaller knife and I'll bring you in a little closer. All right, so I'm gonna go in here and start to create some eye pockets here. Now, you can see that that hat brim is sticking out pretty far. It's sticking out about as far as the nose. Well, that's not going to be the case when I'm all said and done. I, I leave enough wood here to be able to push things back as I go. Okay. That may be not the easiest way of doing it, but I always like to have a little extra wood because if I decide to change something as I go, I can because I've got material to work with. All right. So go in here and uh, reestablish that eye line a little bit. All right, so um, I'm gonna cut on either side of the nose underneath here. and make it stick out even more. And then I'm gonna go on the side of the nose and scoop that out even more. So I'm just working it down as I go. I've never been one of those people that just, I'm just like, I start, you know, and uh, I just make a series of cuts and then it's all of a sudden done. I just, I'm adjusting things as I go. So now I'm going to uh, going to get really bold here. I'm going to curve this nose up just a little bit, make him a little cuter. I'm going to get really bold here. I'm going to show you one of the ways to make a nose and get really deep, really fast. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn my knife, and the knife is actually going to uh, let me do this first. Let me take some triangle cuts here on the side of the nose where the nasolabial fold would be and uh, deepen that just a bit. I'm gonna make some nasty cuts here, but I want I want you to be able to see what I'm what I'm going for here when I do it. Okay, so I've made the triangle cuts on either side of the nose. And uh, I can even extend that up a little bit on the side of the nose. Okay, so now you can start to see that it's moved up here. Sometimes I'll use a, like a, a curved U gouge too to do that. Um, but a lot of times I use a knife too. And you can either take a, uh, a curved gouge kind of like this one and go up either side of the nose. That's one way of doing it. Um, but I'm gonna show you a, a real fun way that I kind of figured out. So I'm gonna go in here with my knife and move this in nice and close so you can see what's going on here. All right, so I'm gonna stick my knife in and this is basically a chip carving cut. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave part of this, this lobe of the nose here I'm gonna go in here and I'll push real deep, curve it up. 
and you can kind of see that curved cut. It's real deep in there. So now I'm going to go in here and uh, let's see if you guys can see that. And I'm going to go in here and relieve that out right here. I made a real deep cut. I'm going to do the same thing. And this takes a little bit of practice because uh, otherwise you end up making a mess. But the depth of your blade going into the wood is really important. Got real deep real quick. Um, let me move something around here. All right, so that's one way of, of doing a nose really fast and really deep. And then you can go in here and clean it up and round it out a little bit as you go. Okay, all right, so now I can, I can actually move that nose around if I want to. I can make it shorter. I can make it stick out further. So I can really, just by leaving a little extra wood there, I can really make things um, the way I want to, if I, if I want to move them around. Okay, um, let's talk about uh, let's talk about eyes real quick. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to move this hat line up just a little bit. Okay. All right, simple enough. Yeah, I want this I want this hat a little higher. So I'm going to move this hat a little bit higher. All right, so let's talk about um, one of the ways that I do my eyes sometimes. I'm gonna go in here with a, just like a, a curved gouge and rough out some cheeks here. All right, so drawing some lines around the cheeks. I'll cut those in real quick. I'm just using a, uh, a chip carving cut. I'll go in here and stick those cheeks out a little bit. Oh, I gotta grab this gouge.
All right. All right. All right, so when we went in the, the, uh, the side of the nose like that, we created these uh, kind of like facets on either side of the nose. And I can go in here and create another facet. So basically, there's a line that kind of goes like this. I'll try to dig that out a little bit so you can see that better. I know this is kind of rough and dirty guys, but I'm trying to do it fast and so you can see it to at least, at least some extent. All right, so above that where I put the eyelid, a lot of times I'll use a knife, but for the sake of time here and whatnot. I'm just going to go in here and create some basic eyelids with this, this uh, gouge. Now, this is kind of a mess because I decided to move something. And that's okay. You can move it all you want to. It's your piece. So as you're going, if you don't like where something's sitting and you know, you're just, like I said, we're just fiddling around here. You can change it. All right. So you can kind of see a, a rough eyelid there. And uh, you can do that with your knife. Um, you can do that with a, a gouge. Another way of, of making this really stand out is you could go in here and make a triangle cut up here. Above the eyelid. And then you can kind of see the eyelids start to stand out a little bit. Hey, Jared, you're a little out of frame. If you'll pull it back toward oh, you. Oh, sorry. Just, yeah, yeah, that's good. Thank you. Okay. So got something like that going. All right. So, um, Sorry, I've got a mess here. Let me clean this up. All right, that's better. All right, so the way I do those those um, those eyes like that, like you saw before, is I'll basically just go in here and do those half moon shaped cuts, like I was showing you. right there where the eyes eyelids come together. I'm gonna to do this pretty quick here. That created just a little bit of shadow there, okay. All right, so now the question is, what do we do with the bottom eyelid? 
And so one of the ways of doing that, I found, let me, uh, let me move some. is just go in here and I like to go right underneath the eyelid, the top eyelid, I'll go in here and make a stabbing cut and then create a triangle, basically right here in the corner. Then I'll relieve that out. Can you see that what happened there? And then I'll go across it. And up to the corner of the eye, I basically just work down to the bottom eyelid. So I can go and do the same thing over here, try to match it up. Oops, oops, we'll go the same angle. Whew. This is rough and dirty today. Whew. All right. So you get the idea. I'm gonna adjust stuff here a little bit. This is nasty looking. All righty. So that, that's how, in a very rough way, I get the eyes to come out like what I was showing you a little bit earlier. And see, if I don't like the profile of the nose, I'll just go in here. And I'll give that a little bit more sweep, make them a little cuter. And then you get something like that. All right, so if I want to put eyebrows in, um, I'm sure I could probably put some eyebrows in here. This hellacious mess I've got going on here. We'll try it. I actually started with a different idea in mind and I decided to change it right as I was going and didn't turn out quite like I wanted, but that's okay. So. I moved the forehead or the hat brim up just a little bit higher with just a couple triangular cuts. And I can even go in here and even though I started with a different idea in mind, I can still change it as I'm going here. See what I mean? Just one cut, change that whole idea. I originally had a, a Santa whose his hat brim was down here right at his eye line and it, his eyes were just going to be peeking out. But just by leaving a little extra wood, I was able to change it to where now I've got, you know, a, a little bit of a forehead and an eyebrow. So that brings me back to my original point is I was making earlier is if you don't like something you can always change it it's like uh, I have this friend who's a painter and he, he told me that um, you know I, I, I was painting and I said I, I just don't like what I'm doing right here I don't like this painting he says well if you don't like it just paint over it well I think you can do that to some extent in wood carving as long as you leave the material there and we've left enough material that 
I was able to go up here and, and uh, create some eyebrows that will just be peeking out from underneath his hat brim. And I still had enough material up here that I was able to move this over or move it up rather. So let's, uh, let's deepen some of these shadows so you can see what the heck's going on with this mess. All righty, let me use a smaller knife because this is getting in the way. Okay, hopefully you guys can see what's going on here. Um, I'm gonna go in here and deepen this line here for the, uh, the eyelid. <sighs> Just by using a chip carving cut, I went right underneath the eyebrow and made a very deep cut. <sighs> See the difference in the shadow now on this side from this? So the same is true here. Uh, da, 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 da. All right. Okay, let's uh, let's do something with this uh, this area right here. So to give this guy some expression right here, this is wonky looking. When I took my my uh, triangles out here to move this hat brim up, so that's a change in design right in the middle of things. Um, what I ended up doing was using two triangle cuts here to bring these eyebrows into play. So I'm gonna go in here and I'm gonna use a, a notch to kind of relieve some of that wood and push that down a little bit. Then I'm gonna go in here. Now that I've created the space, I've got room for my knife to be and I'm just taking that lump right off. All right. I'm gonna clean some of this up. It's going kind of fast and halfway looking at the camera and halfway looking at the knife. So probably not, not the safest thing to do, but. All right. Indulge me if you will while I clean that. All right, that's where we're at there. Um, an easy way of doing eyebrows is, I'm just gonna go in here and uh, make some real fine notches. I like that. And, uh, you know, you can, you can go wild if you want to. The thing I would say about these, these types of notches um, on delicate things like eyebrows or even when you're working on um, eyelids, especially, is be careful about how you make the cut in regards to Remember, I was talking a little bit earlier about, at least I think I talked about it earlier, is when you're making delicate cuts, you should be sliding the knife a little bit in a sawing motion. So, um, when I push down, I'm actually sliding the knife just a little bit. So, I'm not crushing the wood fibers so much. And that keeps them from breaking off quite so bad. And we're going to go even further here. 
and move this even further back, and this even deeper. Why? Because we can. So that created quite a bit more shadow underneath the hat line, right in between the eyebrows. I'm going to go in here and I'm going to do a chip carving cut. So it's curved. It goes deeper in the middle than at the ends. So I'm sliding my knife blade out at the end. If I can get that chip out of there. And uh, what that does is that makes, in my opinion, it makes a more interesting cut than rather than just pulling it right across. All right, so yeah, so you can kind of see now that his face is canted just a little bit like that. It's a little, it's not straight up and down. And his hat brim isn't straight up and down either. And uh, got some eyebrows going. And create a little bit of expression there. Of course, uh, right in between his eyebrows. Let's go up here, sort out the hat because we moved that. And it's going to be, I want to make this a little bit more flat. All right, so I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'm going to use this. Uh, this V gouge. A little bit, just cut in the lines. And um, I'll notch cut them a little deeper so you can see them better. But it gets me going. All right, hopefully you can see that a little better now that I've notched it out. All right, so now we can start to see a little sag and bag to his situation here. Uh, we can see that, or at least that's in my mind's eye, with the help of a pencil, you'll be able to see it too, hopefully. And uh, something, I don't know, maybe like that. So a little bagginess, we'll go in here and cut down to it. Uh, since this line is flowing with this one, I can actually go in here and do a triangle cut in this corner. Something like that maybe. Okay. That down just a little bit more. Okay. All righty. And I'm going to have to move just a little bit because I can't carve from the side very well. I'm trying to get adequate light so you guys can see, but it becomes really tough for me to carve because. I carve with my elbows against my body. And um, if I use the, the muscles in my back rather than the muscles in my hand, so. There we go, clean that up a little bit. Okay, so now we've got a little bit of hat action going on here. Let's see, something like, yeah, that's better. All right, so 
I'm gonna do two big deep notches here and uh, Let's see how that looks. See if we like that any better. Mm. It's all right. But I think I want something right here. So let's do this. Let's create some sort of a uh, Something like that. Okay. You can pick at it all you want. I, I tend to pick at it a lot and move it however I so choose. You can even go in here and uh, take one of these guys, these U gouges, and create some. some curvature of the line. So the hat's kind of swooping up a little bit. All right, fair enough, you get the idea. All right, so Let's talk about what we're gonna do down here. By the way, um, this is not the only way to make an eyelid, a bottom eyelid. Another way of doing it is going in here and taking a deep curving cut underneath the eyelid and then taking another curving cut, kind of scooping that out. And that creates a super deep shadow right there underneath the eyelid. I don't know if you can see that right there. That's another way I'll do it sometimes. Just real, real deep one and then curve it out. And then I'll go in here and work this ridiculous cheek down. All right. All righty, so what are we gonna do with the cheeks? Let's uh, let's do a smiling Santa. And um, let's draw some. Uh, some mustache in here. And just for the sake of time, because I know we're kind of running pretty long here. Um, I'm gonna use a gouge. I'm gonna go in here and right underneath where the mustache is, I'm gonna go in here and use this really shallow sweeping gouge. It's pretty shallow. And uh, So lift it out. Okay. And then uh, I can even do the same thing here, right underneath the mouth and uh, lift it out. One of the things I'm doing I'm turning my gouge a little bit. So I've got an out sweep here, out sweep here, out sweep here, and then an in sweep on the ends. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Let me get this cheek sorted out here. That's the other thing um, I was going to tell you is uh, a lot of times I'll use. A, uh, a different tool to do the same job. 
So, all right, so you can kind of see what's going on there, hopefully. Yes? All right. Let's take a knife in here and I'm going to go in and deepen that a little bit. Try to create a, a little deeper shadow. Hopefully you can see a little better once I do it. Okay. And all right, so hopefully you can see that a little bit clearer in the camera. All right, let's sort out this beard a little bit. Kind of like with the way the mustache is going, so I'm gonna leave it there. I'm gonna go up here, move this nose up just a shade. And as I do that, I'm, I'm going just a little bit deeper. And then if I wanna create a little bit more smile, I might go in here and create a curved cut here, just down the side of the nose. Much, much deeper than it was before. And I'm just working deeper as I go. I like the mustache where it is. Just want my nose a little higher. also lengthens the mustache, it gets bigger. All right, the other side of that nose a little bit. All right, I think we're at a point where we can add some nostrils. And I'll go in and cut even deeper triangle cut in the corner. Now you can see a way, way, way deeper nose. This thing is deep and it's so deep, it's almost, it's probably uh, about two thirds of the way through the, the depth of the wood. Um, okay. My OCD's kicking in here. Uh, let's do this. Quick nostrils. Just gonna go in here with my gouge. Pop them suckers in. And then I'll take my knife, pop them in, pop them out. Okay. And then just keep them from having a pig nose. Sometimes I'll round that out just a little bit on the inside there with the knife. and you get some nostrils, not hard. People do it all the time and there's different ways of doing it. You know, I might do it a different time next time, who knows. Um, all right, so I'm gonna go in here right on the cheek, create a curved cut and then a scooping cut. And I've just made that really, really deep there. See that? And then same here, On the other side. All right, let's see here. Um, we've got a lot of the basic features going here. I'm gonna round up this cheek just a little bit here. There we go. Um, 
Yeah. I'm going to go in here and scoot this out a little bit. There we go. All right. Let's do some quick uh, beardage here. Um, just some, some curved lines. I try to imagine how the, the hair would grow on his face. So I'm gonna go in here, with this shallow gouge and uh, create some curves. And uh, you already see things starting to take shape there. A lot of times when I'm using these gouges, I try to move, instead of moving the gouge through wood, so I've got my elbows, what you can't see right now is I've got my elbows kind of glued to the side of my body and I've kind of kind of huddled up. And uh, so I'm using my back muscles, but a lot of times when I'm using these gouges too, um, I'm actually not moving the gouge that much other than kind of turning it. But a lot of the force, normally you'd use your arm, actually pulling the work towards me a little bit and moving the piece To some extent, I'm going to go in here on the back side. Uh, I just feel like I have a little bit more control over the gouge. Um, when I use that type of motion. All right. I don't think we're going to do any uh, teeth today. This is already taking too long. But let's do a quick... Um, Quick way of doing a mustache. All right, so one of the things to keep in mind, and uh, you can get pretty wild with this this hair. I like to to get a little adventurous with the hair on the mustache um, when there's time, but um, <sighs> things are pretty slow today. Um, one of the ways you can create hair pretty quick is I don't know if you can see this, but I'll take my knife and I'll slide it. And then I'll turn my knife to the side. And I'll take a small chip out. So I'm going in straight or somewhat straight. And then I turn my knife to the side. And then I'm coming up to it. And then I start at the center of the mouth. And I work outwards. And I curve around. The mustache. Okay, so I'll go in here in the center. Now, in order to do this, you really have to have this mustache kind of curved in a, like a dental mound shape. You can't have it too flat because it will not work because there's wood in the way. So you've got to get that wood out of the way. So when you have this kind of curve to your mustache, so he's, he's curving like, you know, you take a bite out of a sandwich, you can get away with that. And uh, 
if you want, you can kind of dazzle that up a little bit with uh, you know, some sort of gouge. as an example. Um, let's see here, let's do this. Let's make his mustache a little bit more wild. I'm gonna go in here and I'm gonna take some, uh, triangle chips out. Hang on a second, there we go. You guys still with me there? Yeah, you're good, Jared. My uh, my phone said low battery here. <laughs> All right, so I went around and I took some triangle chips out on the bottom of the mustache. And as I'm working around, I'm turning the way I put the, uh, the chip in, okay? So I'm gonna go in here and it's fairly straight right there. And then as I go around, the chip is going to come around even more. Man, this is rough. Somebody's got some cleanup work to do <laughs> with this thing's done. All right. So if you want to get a little bit more wild and adventurous, you can go on the bottom there. And basically what I was doing is just taking a little triangle shape out and then going level with the beard and relieving it out. I guess I better pay attention to what I'm doing here, not on the camera. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna go right in here on the side of the nose and I'm going to create an even wilder looking nose. So what I did there is I took this you gouge or whatever you want to call it. I went in there and shaved that puppy down. You can even use the corner of your you gouge if you want and uh, relieve that out. But what that did is that created that type of pinch <laughs> right there. So I guess what I'm getting at is you can start like I did and um, start in one direction and completely end up in another direction by the time you end it, as long as you uh, leave enough material to work with. So I'm gonna do one more cleanup here and then we'll call it a, call it a day for a, I'd probably sit there and pick at him for a little bit longer, but, uh, You know, going in here and deepening some of these things here. But you get the general idea is you can, you can move things around as you go, as long as you leave enough wood there to start with. And notice I started from the highest point and worked to the deepest point because as I go, I can move things around if I'd started in the deepest spot, I, I would have already committed to it and uh, I'd be in trouble. I wouldn't have been able to move, move this hat up. I wouldn't have been able to create eyebrows there. Um, none of that would have been possible. So that's, that's really what I wanted to show you is uh, just, be okay with 
and changing things, be okay with being a little adventurous. I, I had zero plans as far as what I was going to carve, uh, how I was going to carve it, what the design was going to be. And uh, it worked out okay. And, uh, you know, it's not perfect, but I'll pick around off camera and make it nice and clean and I'll paint him up. Maybe what I'll do is I'll paint him on camera on my uh, YouTube channel so you can see, you know, one of, one of the many ways of, of painting and uh, finishing. Um, real quick, I was gonna say finishing wise, how, people always ask this question, uh, how do you finish your carvings? What do you like to use? And uh, sometimes I use BLO and I'm really into that and you know, waxing. Uh, and then other times I might decide, and this, this is true with a lot of my uh, ornaments and, and stuff, is I'll seal it with a clear matte enamel. <sighs> Why matte? Well, I like the matte because if you use multiple layers of the matte on top of your paint, it doesn't make it look like plastic and you can you can make a, a really nice um like semi semi gloss it's almost like a it's like a satin sheen to it um and uh they turn out real nice i think when you do it that way so it so what i'll do is i'll paint him i won't seal him with blo to start with i'll paint him just like this normally what i'll do is I'll, I'll go to the sink i'll give him a good scrub knock all the junk out um which there's a lot of it on this one because i was pretty pretty carving pretty gross here but um and then i will paint him up and i'll paint him with uh, acrylics really watered down like most people do and then I'll adjust things as I go. He's already wet because I just wet him down at the sink. So all that kind of softens the, the uh, paint. And then um, once I get him the way I want him, I'll let him dry. And then I'll shoot probably three to five coats of that clear matte enamel on there. And that's how I get the finish I get on a lot of those ornaments and some of the Santos that I do. So that's one way I do it. I don't do it that way all the time, but I don't know, people seem to like the way it turns out, people I give it to, or maybe they're just humoring me because uh, they're just like, hey, free wood carving. But I like the way it turns out. And by golly, if, if I like the way I end up doing something, that's a miracle because most of the time I don't. So you guys have any questions or any comments, concerns? I know I wasn't sure that this was going to even turn out with the darn. <laughs> but, but 10 minutes into it, I was like, oh God, I should just throw this away. But that goes back to what I was saying to begin with, just have the confidence to stick with it and, and not be afraid to change something if you don't like it or you had a different idea in your head and that's just not the way it's turning out. Um, you can always go back and, and recarve it or, or move things around. Jared, do you take and put something on them to hang them off the trees or something? Yeah, um, I use a lot of times. I'm gonna since we're done, you don't want to sit here and watch me pick at this thing. Um, oh my, there we go. A lot of times, what I'll use is um, you can get these. Um, they're called eye pins from like Michaels or something. They're they're used for jewelry but they've got a loop in the end of it. And it's just light enough. It's not like one of those screw in things that I can never find them light enough to not be uh -huh. like huge and obtrusive. So I'll, uh, I'll take something like one of those eye pins that come real long. So I'll cut it off till it's about, you know, maybe an inch long and I'll take a pair of needle nose pliers and I'll just smish it in there and it goes really well into basswood because you're going in the end grain. So it just smushes right down in there, stays on real good. And then uh, I'll get a piece of twine or something to, to uh, 
you know, hang it on. <laughs> I, I usually don't use wire um, just because I like the way the, the uh, twine ones hang. So, yeah. Hey, Jared, you, uh, you mentioned um, your YouTube page. What is your YouTube, YouTube channel and also where can they find your work? Okay, so my YouTube page is Jared Wood Carving. And uh, I haven't been posting there a lot. Where I tend to post a lot of my stuff, and I, I do a lot of like live, way better than this, <laughs> this, this quote unquote demonstration. Um, but I do a lot of live stuff on, uh, on uh, Instagram. Wood.jared is my uh, handle or whatever you want to call it. And um, that's where I do a lot of these. So uh, as far as my work, you can find my work. Um, so right now I, I don't have an Etsy store because um, a lot of times I just, Quite frankly, I just give a lot of my stuff away, but um, people DM me, uh, they'll DM me on my uh, Instagram, they'll DM me on Facebook, and I'm just Jared Wood on Facebook, and that's how we work out a lot of those sales. So um, somebody asked me about an Etsy store, like, Hey, when are you going to get an Etsy store? And I was like, you know, I ought to, but you know, time and all that stuff are always a factor. And I just haven't had the time to sit down and really set one up because, um, I'm, I'm a, a dude with a lot of hats. I, I work as a, a full-time professional and, uh, in public safety. And then, um, you know, on my weekends, I'm a full-time uh, homeschooling parent. We homeschool our kids. And so, uh, very, very busy. <laughs> and uh, so, um, yeah, maybe maybe one of these days we'll, uh, we'll get an Etsy store going. But, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of people out there with a lot of great carvings. And, you know, there's be one more in the mix, I guess. Jared, you talked about sharpening your uh, your pocket knife there and changing the bevel. What do you use to do that? Okay, so um, with when you change a, a tool, these these steels have been, you know, when you grind them and and do all the work on them, they're annealed steel, so they're soft, and then they've been heat treated and so on and so forth to retain a certain edge, right? Um, you know, a lot of these are in the upper 50s in the Rockwell scale. And uh, so you don't want to use something like a, uh, say like a, a belt grinder, belt sander, something like that to grind them down. Um, so you want to remove the stock slowly. And a lot of times what I'll use is a good old fashioned whetstone. I, I like to use oil stones. Um, because uh, oil stones just seem to stay wet all the time and I'm not constantly putting a bunch of water on them. There we go. I'm, I'm at like 10%, so I'm gonna have to bolt here. But, um, and then once I get that secondary bevel worked off of there and I'm, I'm pretty close, I'll work through my grits. Let's say I start with a really uh, coarse oil stone. I'll go to a fine oil stone, then I'll go to sandpaper. And um, I'll usually go uh, from a fine stone, I'll go to 600 and then I'll go to about 1,000, 1,500, somewhere around there. And I, I use those pieces of sandpaper over and over and over again. And uh, they get finer and, f finer and finer and finer. I've got one piece in here that I've used so many times that's probably like 6,000 grit or some ridiculous thing like that because I've just, I've worn it down so much. And then of course I go to a strop. But the idea is I, I never want my steel to have any scratch marks in it. Uh, it's something that you get from spoon carving. You always want just a 
super polished bevel. That way, when you're leaving facets, you're leaving clean facets, you know, like, like that, you know, they're polished and uh, the tool burnishes the wood as it, as it goes through. So that's, uh, that's kind of what I do as far as changing them. A lot of elbow grease, blood, sweat, and profanity, and uh, you'll get what you want. All right, Derek, we're at uh, 4.36 Eastern time. Does anybody else have questions before we stop the meeting here? Okay, if not, uh, Jared, I just want to say thank you again for taking time out of your day to, uh, to present for us. It was great information. Uh, definitely love your work and look forward to uh, every time that you post something. So thank you for that. I uh, want to remind everybody that uh, we have quite a few people coming up in the coming weeks as far as our presentations go. Uh, next weekend, we'll have Dave Stetson on doing a demonstration for us. Uh, Yarn will also be coming on to talk about the uh, new website called Wood Carving Academy, where there'll be classes uh, that'll be offered on there as a subscription. And uh, it'll be interesting to hear what he has in store for us uh, through the Wood Carving Academy. Uh, the following week on November 21st, we'll have Kevin Applegate coming on. Uh, again, Kevin offers uh, classes on his website on secondalarmwoodcarving.com to so check him out. Uh, on the 28th of November, we'll have Jim Feather coming back on to do a demonstration. Uh, Jim's actually going to talk to us about how to make um, ornaments out of um, um, just, I guess, miscellaneous blocks. Uh, leftover scrap and stuff. So uh, Jim will be on doing a demonstration on the 28th. Uh, on December the 5th, Larry Green is going to come on to do a demonstration on doing uh, Christmas trees. So it'll be Christmas season. We'll get ready for that. Uh, so we look forward to Larry coming on December the 5th. Uh, on December 12th, we have Ryan Olson that's going to be coming on talking about his carving journey. And on December the 19th, we'll have Wayne Larimore coming on talking about his carving journey and uh, his membership of CCA. So uh, quite a few people coming up uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, again, thank you for tuning in today. And Jared, again, thank you for coming on and doing the demonstration. Uh, we look forward to seeing some more work from you. And uh, we'll definitely look forward to some other videos out on YouTube. So uh, thanks again for all you do for us. And uh, thank you all for joining us today. And again, we'll be on next week at 3 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. Thank you all.